So I know that Dr. Cochran has a, a lot to say today and a packed presentation. So while people are signing in, I'm just going to start talking. People can listen to me or not. <laughs> Um, probably, probably better too. So, uh, I, I wanted to tell you about some upcoming events um, before we get into today's presentation. Next week, um, many uh, many of you know we have uh, um, some really wonderful people coming in to join us who will be uh, talking about cases presented around the concept of treatment refractory depression, and that's Mike Gitlin, Dave Dunner, and Don Klein will be joining Jan Fawcett. It's a special Grand Rounds that goes from 10.30 to 12. Then there's an hour break for lunch and we resume a 1 to 2.30 and the CMEs <clears throat> will reflect the time spent. We also next week are joined by uh, Dr. Rochelle Gittleman-Klein who will be giving a presentation from 4 to 5.30 at the Rotunda in the Science and Technology Park there on University and Base Heart. And her presentation will be about recognizing and diagnosing psychiatric disorders in school-aged children. So hope to, to see you all at these events. And while people are <coughs> coming in, joining us, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker and actually my, my history with, with what we're talking about today. So I think uh, some of you that know me know that I've been the lightning rod for <clears throat> the importance of long-term psychodynamic psychotherapy. I think I thought that people really all needed seven years of help four times a week, sort of like what I had. Um, and uh, it was often frustrated that we couldn't provide that for the world. So um, so, so I've been teaching that and, and was fortunate to learn all about attachment theories. And then came this brochure uh, about three years ago for a conference in San Diego about intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, uh, which was built as a therapy with a a building evidence base that was short term, um, uh, accessible to learn, and the therapy that attachment theory had been searching for. So I went to the conference and uh, met some interesting people and uh, Alan Abbas, uh, some of us saw him when he gave to, came to give Grand Rounds about a year and a half ago and he did a series of uh, tele-supervision with, with a small group of us and, and taught us some more about the paradigm. When I was at that conference, a, a dear friend of mine who had been my best friend's analyst, actually, when I was a resident, said, um, if you really want to learn this, you need to call Dr. Patricia Coughlin. So I did and was uh, have been very fortunate to have the opportunity to be supervised by Dr. Coughlin. And I videotape my cases now, and she supervises me over Skype. And uh, I, I cannot tell you how helpful it has been for me. It's been fun, I think, for the residents who've watched me be supervised as well. And, um, and I've really watched my patients get better very quickly um, based on uh, highly specific factors, specific interventions uh, that Dr. Coughlin has, has taught me and shown me. Um, so a bit about Dr. Patricia Coughlin. She's a licensed clinical psychologist with over 30 years of clinical experience. In addition to seeing patients in her private practice, she conducts trainings and supervision groups for mental health professionals all around the world. She's held faculty possession, positions at Northwestern, Albany, Albany Medical College, and Thomas Jefferson Medical School. Over the past 20 years, she's written professionally, given presentations at conferences, and conducted workshops for mental health professionals around the world, including New York, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and now us. Her first book, book Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy Theory and Technique, is considered a classic in the field. And she went on to write another book uh, called Life, Lives Transformed uh, with Dr. David Malin. So I don't want to take up any more time um, for uh, what should be a packed presentation. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Coughlin. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Katzman and all the people involved in ideas in psychiatry for bringing me here. Um, I gave a workshop yesterday for the community, and people were really warm and welcoming and enthusiastic. So uh, it's been a great trip, and I look forward to talking to you today about my own conviction uh, that specific factors uh, actually have an enormous impact on outcomes. So I hope I can make a case for that. We'll see. Um, and so what I'll be doing is um, looking at the research to support that notion, specifically, again, focusing on 
uh, intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, which we call ISTDP for short. And then um, I'm also going to be showing you a videotape of maybe the first 20, 25 minutes of an interview um, with a, what I would consider a highly resistant patient uh, who had failed at uh, any number of previous treatments. And I hope that you'll actually be able to see that her response to my intervention is the result of some pretty specific factors. Um, also just want to emphasize again the uh, enormous gift that patients give us by allowing all of us to learn. Uh, from their treatments and to really keep their confidentiality in mind. So when I first show you the tape, if anyone does recognize this woman, uh, please do excuse yourself, okay? So, um, and hopefully I can get all that in, right, with enough time for some questions and answers. So uh, let's uh, get going and, and see how uh, we can progress here. Um, I thought I would start with this wonderful New Yorker cartoon. Um, I think we all have this recurring dream and hope that, uh, you know, we'll actually be able to produce uh, reliable, consistent results for our patients. So uh, let's see how we might be able to do that. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to suggest is that all this data that we're very familiar with, that it's common factors that are responsible for outcome in psychotherapy, might actually be an artifact of the way that we do these randomized clinical trials. Uh, first of all, comparing groups uh, is not really the best way for us as individual psychotherapists to get data about what's going to ha help an individual. So I'm really not that interested about the, what happens with one group versus another. What I really want to know is what's going to help an individual over time as the result of our interventions, right? So we're going to need some other tools to be able to study that. And by comparing groups, we're hiding a lot of that individual difference that's so important to us. Uh, some of the other problems, I think, with these randomized trials is that the criteria for selection are often extremely stringent. So they are weeding out most of the patients that we're seeing every day in our office. You know, they want to find someone that, who just has an anxiety disorder or who's just depressed, right, and doesn't also have anxiety, right, and also have a personality disorder, right? So again, even that information we're getting isn't very applicable applicable to the patients that we're treating. Because uh, it looks like, you know, right now, the research suggests 80% of the people uh, who come to us for outpatient psychotherapy actually do have multiple presenting symptoms and usually have some kind of personality disorder. So, um, you know, those healthy people that are getting selected for do tend to respond to almost anything. Right, so the fact that we keep getting these consistent results that everything's helpful and there are no differences may not be what's actually true about the melanoma, but it's true for that 20% of pretty healthy patients. Right, there's also an alarmingly high dropout rate in most psychotherapy. It's looking like about 47%, so almost half the patients who come to us initially end up dropping out before they get any benefits. So again, the people that we're studying are only those who engage, right, but what about that other uh, 40 to 50 percent, okay? So what does this data suggest? Again, if you read a lot of the uh, major journals in psychotherapy, they're now calling, some of them, for a complete end to randomized clinical trials. They're saying to some extent it's a waste of our resources. We've done a thousand of these studies and they always come up with the same result, right? So let's do something else instead. How about doing much more process research and also N of one, the case study is coming back into favor. Um, and also if you do accumulated of ones, right? That can also be very powerful. Again, if you look at most of the research, they're looking at patient variables and treatment variables, or mod, you know, the model being used, but they're generally neglecting what looks like the most potent but understudied variable, which is the person of the therapist. Right, if you look at that research, right, it looks like the top 15 to 20 percent of therapists who Duncan and Miller call the super shrinks, um, they are getting better and more consistent results than the other 80 percent combined. So we need to study these folks and find out what are they doing, what are the characteristics of these super shrinks. Well, some of them seem to be, in a way, personality variables, right? These are people who tend to be enthusiastic present, engaged, they're an authentic presence, they're approachable, confident, 
and courageous. They also tend to be very passionate about their particular approach. So whether it's CBT or ISTDP, they're really enthusiastic and passionate about their approach, and at the same time, they're flexible when implementing that approach, really being able to tailor it to the specific needs and capacities of the patient they have uh, in the room with them. Um, the other characteristic is that they tend to be extremely ambitious and they push themselves and the patient to get extraordinary results. So they don't stop when they get a little bit of symptom change, right? These are folks who aren't satisfied helping somebody go from being severely depressed to moderately depressed, right? They really want to see, is it possible to have a complete lifting of the depression and restore somebody to a sense of well-being? Right, so they'll push themselves and also push their patients for those kinds of results. They also tend to be lifelong learners who are really open to feedback and they'll actively solicit that feedback from their patients instead of getting defensive if the patient says, listen, you know, I've been coming here for two months, nothing's happening. You know, they'll say, really, tell me about that. You know, let, let's see if we can find a better way to help you. Right, so they're open to that feedback and they are flexible. They also are masters at handling the relationship, particularly highly conflictual interactions, negative and hostile reactions that the patients are having. There's a lot of research that therapists who avoid this or they try to deal with the patient's negative reactions toward other people but don't take it up you know, directly in the transference, either get a negative outcome or the patient drops out, right? So these therapists, again, tend to be kind of confident and courageous, and they'll go right in and deal directly with the negative feelings that the patient is having. And again, this seems to make them uh, highly effective. Um, there was a wonderful um, study that I don't know how many people are familiar with, uh, by Weinberger, published back in 95, about this whole issue of common factors. And the title of his paper was Common Factors Are Not So Common, right? So he did a large meta-analysis, and he did discover five factors, right, which looked like these common factors across different treatment models that were responsible for outcome. So, of course, the one we all know about, the relationship, right, and alliance, but what he found was that that actually contributed only about 11% to the variance. So it was a necessary but insufficient variable for actual change. Uh, being able to help the re revive hope. Our patients come to us very dispirited and demoralized, which you'll certainly see in the case that I'll show you today. How do you work with them to revive some realistic hope about being able to work together toward change? The most potent factor, which is responsible for over 40% of the variance, was in however you do it, helping the patient to approach and confront what they've been avoiding. Doing that then ends up increasing their sense of mastery and competence, and also, the more the patient attributes the success of the treatment to their own efforts, the better they're gonna be, right? So actually, again, as Weinberger looked into this data, what he found was that most therapies only focus on one or two of these common factors, right? So a lot of um, humanistic or even psychodynamic um, therapists are really only focusing on the issue of relationship, right? The relationship here between you and me, right? But we know that that's not gonna be enough. So he actually suggested that it's common neglect of some of these factors that might be responsible for this consistent finding of no differences, right? So again, what I'm gonna be, did this just go off? Yeah. Did I switch it? Hello, is it back? Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to be talking to you mostly today about ISTDP and my hypothesis about why this particular model I think is very effective is because it actually incorporates all of these factors into a comprehensive system of intervention. And we actually use response to intervention as our primary diagnostic tool and our guide for intervention. And again, in that way, the model is, is sort of tailor-made 
again, for the needs and capacities of each patient. So even though uh, when people first see ISTDP, they tend to be riveted by the intense sort of emotional outpouring, but that's really only one of the factors. It's a, it's a multimodal system. Um, there's another very interesting, actually two studies that were written up in a dissertation at Penn on, again, the process variables, uh, looking at specific versus common factors in both psychodynamic psychotherapy and a behavioral treatment. And they actually found that it was specific factors, not common factors, that actually predicted outcome. So specific factors are those that are actually directly tied right to the theory of the treatment being used. And they've had a very interesting finding. There was this curvilinear relationship between specific factors and outcome. So that it was people who used a moderate level of specific factors, along with those common factors, right, of, of being encouraging and connecting and so on, who seemed to get the best results. So if there was too high a use of specific factors or too low, they didn't get as good an outcome. And when it came to dynamic psychotherapy, it was those process experiential interventions that tended to have the best uh, relationship to outcome, as opposed to interpretation, which we always tend to associate with psychoanalytic treatments. So again, if we focus on uh, Davenler's method of ISTDP, he asserted decades ago that dynamic psychotherapy can be not merely effective but uniquely effective. And he suggested that it was specific rather than nonspecific factors that were responsible for this outcome. In particular, in his own studies, he found that helping patients face and viscerally experience the feelings they had been avoiding was the key to deep and rapid change. So our basic understanding is that patients' problems are the inevitable result of excessive reliances on defenses against anxiety-provoking feelings. Right, so since that's how we understand the creation and maintenance of the problem, then it would make sense that the therapeutic intervention, right, would have to help patients abandon these defenses so they could experience their feelings directly, allowing for a development of an intimate relationship with self and other. Right, so when patients are detached from or avoiding their own feelings, they don't have a very intimate relationship with themselves. They don't know themselves very well. And again, all the material that we're getting from neuroscience, I mean, in some ways it surprises me that the people in advertising and marketing seem to know better than we do that human beings make most of their decisions based on emotional factors, right? Not on all these rational, uh, reasons that we pile on top of it. So again, if we can help patients really know what they're feeling and then make some conscious choices about that, we should be able to get some better results. So Davenlu actually created a method where incorporating what he calls the central dynamic sequence. And here I think you'll see these different steps. Um, that are involved in the method, and then I'm going to talk about the process research that supports each one of these sort of phases of the treatment. So we always start with inquiry, looking at what brings the patient to our office now. What is their current problem and also something about the history of that problem? And we do this with specificity and focus. And we will challenge any defense of vagueness or generality so that we can really get a very clear idea of what the problems are that the patient wants our help with. If we don't have that, we can't help them very well. Right? Then we begin, as soon as we get an idea about what the problems are and some of the precipitating uh, triggers to these problems, we then begin to focus on the emotions that get activated in these conflictual situations which are giving rise to their symptoms and difficulties. And as we do this, we block the defenses that hurt them and perpetuate their suffering and thereby offer a healthy, healthy alternative of actually contacting the genuine feeling involved. Because again, it looks like experience of feeling on many levels, cognitively, emotionally, physiologically, is the key that seems to unlock the unconscious and aid derepression, shedding light on the origin of the patient's conflicts. 
right? Once this happens, we want to reflect on and understand, right, all of the material we've gotten so that we can create meaning and coherence. Okay, so I think you can see it's a multimodal approach. So again, what's the evidence suggesting that these different components are helpful? Again, when we're talking about alliance building, um, many of the, the defenses that patients use actually prevent them from creating a healthy working alliance with us. So it's really important um, that we try to get through that. We know that alliance is not just about being warm and supportive. In fact, some of the most recent research suggests that it's the patient's perception of the therapist's skill and competence right, that has the greatest impact. They see you as a real um, advocate and resource for them. It also looks like it's not just a positive alliance, right, where the patient really likes you, right, but a collaborative alliance that is required for the co-creation of a relationship for change. We need to help our patients get actively involved and join with us, right, in the endeavor, right. If they remain passive and we take sort of an omnipotent approach, right, we're not going to get very uh, effective results. Um, and this requires the therapist to be able to, to see, to discover, and to strengthen the health and capacity of the patient. If we just get stuck in a medical model, right, of just focusing on the problems, and we don't see that it's a person with problems, right, who also has some strengths and capacities to bring to the endeavor, right, we're not, we're going to end up again with a passive uh, recipient of treatment rather than uh, a collaborator. Again, what we have found when we look into what really makes for a strong working alliance, it's agreement on the nature of the problem, the goals that the patient has for treatment, and the therapeutic task, right? So often our patients come in with problems and goals that in a way aren't appropriate for psychotherapy. Uh, you'll see the, the woman I'm going to show you, she says, well, you're not going to be able to help me with what I want anyway. And I said, well, what is that? She says, well, you know, I want a partner. I want more money. I want, you know, she thinks she wants these external things, right? And she's right. I can't help her with that, right? But is there an internal problem that she's having that I might be able to help her with, right? So we have to agree on the problems the goals and the task in order to form this kind of collaborative working alliance. And there is some new research suggesting that a really strong alliance is often the result, not the cause, right, of therapeutic movement. Yeah. Right, so if we go to that step one and are getting, a re getting and keeping right, in our case an internal focus, there's a lot of research to support that keeping that focus, a therapeutic focus, is highly related to outcome. And in particular, it's been found that there are low levels of relapses in patients who get very focused treatments and three times the relapse in unfocused treatments. There's also um, data that suggests a lack of focus is highly predictive of poor outcome. Right, then we begin to work on the defenses that are in the way of creating, right, this healthy alliance and getting to the bottom of the patient's problems. And recently, really, Phoebe Kramer has probably done more than anybody to bring defenses back, right, into the realm of research. And uh, first of all, she's been able to establish that defenses are pervasive in human functioning. And also, that even though feelings are defended against and the patient's unaware of this, them, there's a lot of evidence that they still have an impact on functioning on many levels, right? So patients who tend to repress and deny their feelings suffer physically, occupationally, and interpersonally, as well as emotionally. And there's also uh, evidence to suggest that change in defensive structure, right, is highly predictive of improvement. So us going in and working actively on defenses, right, uh, has some research support as being uh, effective. Right, then the emotion focus itself. Again, there's more and more evidence of the importance of emotional experience for effective therapy in both short and long-term treatments. Again, neurobiological studies are now suggesting that new learning and neural growth is greatly enhanced by the direct experience of both anxiety and affect. 
In fact, uh, Alan Abbas has also found a dose-response relationship between the intensity of emotion and the relief of symptoms, right? So it's not just medication, right, that, that has that kind of dose-response relationship. Uh, there's also data that high levels of emotional experiencing are associated with significant sessions, which are also associated with superior outcome. Right, so once we get through the defenses to the experience of the emotions, we then need to have a cognitive reflection and understanding of all this emotional experience. And again, that piece, right, this is not a cathartic treatment. If you're just helping people get in touch with their feelings and express them, right, and you're not having a deep understanding right, of, of the conflicts that have arisen around that and how it's impacted them, you're not going to get good outcome. Right? And Pennebaker, who's done a tremendous amount of research on this at the University of Texas, has found that it's the deep understanding of self and other that comes as a result of this emotional experience that has the greatest lasting impact for patients. But only patients who get emotionally involved in the process seem to get that result. Right. We also know that having this kind of deep understanding of your emotional experience aids in the development of a coherent life narrative, right, which is highly associated with long-term health and well-being. Right. So again, when we're doing research, we're mostly, uh, it's our view as the therapist, it's the researcher's view, all of our raters are professionals, but what about the patient and their view? of what's really been helpful to them in their psychotherapies. Well, Suzanne Perillo did an interesting study on this, examining the patient's responses and their feedback to two forms of therapy. One was ISTDP, and the other was a much more supportive, but still uh, sort of expressive uh, psychotherapy. And again, in both treatment groups, two-thirds of the patients were significantly improved after 30 sessions and 90% of the patients attributed their gains to these kinds of factors. In session, emotional experiencing, sessions that were highly, intensely emotional, they felt releasing buried feelings, the affect focus, and getting to those bottled up feelings really was the most often cited factor from the patient's point of view that really helped them. They also said that it was technical expertise more than therapist warmth, right, that helped them, and that the ISTDP therapists were more likely to be viewed as competent and skillful. Right, so again, when we look at ISTDP, what's the evidence of effectiveness? Well, there was a Cochrane review published, I think, in 2006, right, looking at over 60 randomized clinical trials on the effectiveness of short-term dynamic psychotherapy. And it was found that it's effective in 86% of all patients. So it is widely applicable, including a wide range of disorders like those with comorbid personality disorders, treatment-resistant patients, treatment-resistant depression, psychosomatic disorders, movement disorders, a lot of patients that other treatments don't seem to be able to help. Um, there also is a very low dropout rate in ISTDP, about 7% instead of 47%. So again, we, we seem to be reaching and engaging a lot of patients who aren't engaging in other kinds of therapies. Also, the effect sizes are very large, 1.0 or above, and they're standing up over long-term follow-up. Um, we have three-year follow-up at this point, and also that it's highly cost-effective. It saves three times the amount of money uh, that you're actually going to spend on the therapy itself. So if we look at a couple of the specific um, uh, studies that I think are pretty outstanding. Um, there, there was one done recently looking at the difference between an ISTDP intake and a standard intake. So they randomly assigned 30 patients. One would get the standard, one would get the ISTDP, then six weeks of no treatment, and then they'd reassess. So they both got an interview, but they also filled out a lot of standard paper and pencil tests like the BSI and the IIP and things like that. So after this six-week break with no treatment, there was a very significant symptom reduction uh, in the ISTDP group. In fact, 33% of the patients no longer required any treatment. Seven out of 10 went off their medications. Two of the unemployed went back to work. 
Uh, in contrast, there was no significant therapeutic effect from the traditional psychiatric intake. Right, so I think, again, this, this might tell us why we have fewer outcomes. I mean, uh, fewer, that was an interesting slip, uh, fewer dropouts, right? Uh, because we're engaging people and we're making a difference right from the start. Um, also, a very interesting recent study on unexplained medical symptoms in the emergency room. So in Canada, um, and I would assume it's similar in the States, um, three out of four patients coming into the ER with chest pain leave the ER with no physical finding, right? And in fact, one out of every six patients coming into the ER, uh, only one in six, come out with a clear medical diagnosis. So a lot of people presenting in an emergency, it's looking like are having some kind of anxiety or emotional experience that's being manifested in somatic symptoms. So they put a, a psychologist trained in ISTDP in the emergency room to see these patients once they were cleared and made sure, again, that there was no physical problem. And many of these patients were the very frequent repeat users, in fact, up to 100 visits a year. So there were 77 patients in this study, and they received, on average, uh, less than four sessions of ISTDP, specifically focusing on the emotions that were sort of underneath, the suppressed emotions connected to their physical symptoms. And again, having fewer than four sessions like that, 80% of the panic patients uh, stopped coming back to the ER, and there was a 68% reduction in symptoms in all of these 77 patients, again, resulting in huge cost savings, as well as a lot of reduced suffering uh, for these patients. Um, in Norway, that this uh, research is just going into print now, uh, they developed uh, an ISTDP inpatient unit specifically for treatment resistant patients. Um, in Norway, they have a single payer system. They've got these patients for life. And so they actually are motivated to see if they can do something to get them better in the long run. So there were 36 uh, patients who all met the criteria for treatment resistant. They had failed at at least three previous treatments. Uh, many of these had been repeatedly hospitalized and they were very dysfunctional, not able to work and so on. So they had an eight week inpatient stay that was all focused around ISTDP. So they, each person would get 16 to 20 hours of individual ISTDP, but all their groups and, and things like that were also focused around their conflicts around feelings. And they got some very, very significant results uh, with this difficult group. So after eight weeks, 82% of the patients were significantly clinically uh, improved on the OQ45, and 94% of them were uh, improved at the one-year follow-up. Significantly, no one got worse, right? And very often in that group, people do get worse uh, when they're hospitalized. And the effect sizes, again, were very large, 1.42, uh, at termination, 1.57 at follow-up, and on the SCL90, again, uh, 0.96 at termination and 1.24 at follow-up. Most significant, it seems to me, is that at termination, after eight weeks, 58% of these patients scored as recovered. In other words, their scores were below the cutoff for a clinical population. And at follow-up, it was up to 71%. And this is a finding that Malin first discovered decades ago um, in his studies at the Tavistock and are now getting substantiated, that patients who do respond to ISTDP not only maintain their gains at follow-up, but they get better and better and better you know, with no further treatment. How do we explain that? I mean, it seems to me, uh, and we'll have to test this out somehow, right, is that by removing defenses, defenses actually, in my view, stunt growth, right? They prevent growth and maturation. So when we remove the defenses and the patient gains access to their feelings, begins to have a more connected relationship to themselves and others, their growth and development seems to take off. Um, if we look at some of the recent um, studies, uh, Grauer's book is, is fabulous on neuropsychotherapy, Casalino, David Schnarch, right, are reporting these um, studies. What does it take to change an adult brain, right? And it looks like there are a number of factors 
uh, that are reliably associated with changing an adult brain. One is being able to create and maintain a high level of intense focus. That seems to be required. So whether we're trying to learn the piano <laughs> at, at our advanced age or uh, learning to get out of some old habitual patterns, having this intense focus is really essential. Um, also, the establishment of trust, which again tends to be uh, done by demonstrating skill and competence, and again, building this collaborative alliance where two people are working actively together seems to be required. Um, also, facilitating multiple levels of experience. And this is something that we're trying to do all the time in ISTDP, that we want all this online, that the patient is cognitively clear about what's happening. We're creating an emotionally charged atmosphere where there's actual physical, physiological activation. And also, we're attending to our interaction with the patient. So the more you can get and keep those four aspects uh, up and running, the more likely it is that you're going to change uh, the brain of your patients. Also, very significantly, there's studies suggesting that in order to change an adult brain, we must introduce stress and anxiety into the system. That if anxiety is too low, there's no new learning. If it's too high and the patient is flooded, there's going to be no new learning. So finding and maintaining kind of their um, optimal level of anxiety uh, is really important to get change. And then encouraging intimacy and profound moments of meaning and meeting uh, also really changes uh, our brains and then creating meaning from this entire experience. So again, I think as you look at these, you can see how they're highly related to the different stages of the treatment in ISTDP. So what's the take home message from all of this? Um, it seems to me, my reading right, of the research is that it's both who you are and what you do that makes the difference. So our own personal development and then always learning and developing specific skills to get more and more effective, right? That we keep learning. Evidence that creating and maintaining a therapeutic focus, facilitating emotional experience and removing defenses, all of those things are gonna really help enhance your outcomes. Being open to and even eliciting feedback from your patients and doing follow-up is also going to greatly enhance your outcomes. Taping your sessions, watching your tapes, and getting supervision is also going to really help you to be as good as you can possibly be. Okay, so um, that's some of the research, and now we're going to look at a case because, again, this is evidence too. You'll be able to see in front of you how I intervene with this woman who I call the woman who thought it was too late. She is a 69-year-old single woman who was referred by her physician. Um, I was uh, working at the Center for Integrative Medicine, and I was going to be leaving to take a year's sabbatical. And one of my uh, colleagues, who actually is an extraordinary physician and highly skilled right, at, at interpersonal interactions, was at her wit's end with this woman. She called me begging, literally please see her. I said, I can't see her. I'm leaving. I, you know, I could only say, I don't care. Even one or two sessions, anything. She said, she keeps coming to me. She calls constantly. She wants to come in and have an appointment, but I can't even get her to focus on what the problem is or how I can help her. She is all over the place, incoherent. Um, if there's anything you could do, please help. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try. I can probably only see her three or four times. So let's just see what we can do, OK? So this is my first session with her. Um, I also knew from the physician that she really had a lifelong history of, of trying all different kinds of therapies. But again, uh, she never could get on with anyone and always um, uh, broke it off and was never able to get help. Right, so I hope that what you'll be able to see as far as some of the specific factors um, is you'll see me, I, I think, and you'll see for yourself, that what she presents with from the very start are all kinds of defenses against even being specific or present. So my blocking these defenses and encouraging her right, to create a collaborative alliance with me, appealing to the healthy part of her. 
Um, also, my, I'm always keeping my eye on anxiety. And as we look into that, her anxiety is extremely high and going into cognitive disruption. She's saying her head is swirling around. And I think you'll see me intervene in order to bring that anxiety down into a manageable level where she actually gets it in the body and starts to tense up. And as she does that, I then invite her to experience and express the ready-made transference feelings that she comes into the session with and that are really driving her anxiety and defense. So it seems to me that those are three pretty specific interventions I use to try to even make contact with this woman and form a therapeutic alliance, right, which she really hasn't been able to do uh, with her physician or other um, therapists before. Okay, so given the time, if it's okay with you, we'll just go to the videotape, watch that, and then we'll have our open discussion question and answer. Is that okay? I know it's a lot of material, but um, let's give that a go. And let's see if I can. So, I hope you can see, or I'd be interested to hear what you have to say uh, about whether you could see the use of some specific uh, techniques and factors that uh, helped uh, to actually make some kind of contact with this woman to get through the defenses to this massive uh, reservoir of, of pain and rage uh, that she's had all her life. And, you know, there was a lot of laughing throughout. And I think, you know, it, it's not funny. It's a very tragic uh, situation. Um, but I think it stirs up our anxiety, right, that she is so primitive Right, and within a couple of minutes, you know, has this easy access, right, to wanting to bite my face and all of this. I mean, it just gives us such a real sense of what she's been struggling with and how she could possibly get close to anybody, right, because this is what you would confront with her. So at least by being able to get through to that uh, part of her, and, and now we can begin to develop a collaborative alliance. We, we get the story about what actually happened in her growing up and what, the, what her current life is like. And the uh, physician who had referred her uh, called me the next week and said, I don't know what you did, but we had the first coherent conversation we've ever had. She came in, she was calm, she was able to relate to me, and we could talk together uh, about you know, what she really needs. So it, it looks like it had some positive effect for her. So um, let's just open this up to questions, comments, reflections um, on anything that I've presented today. So is there a, a roaming? Uh, oh, great, terrific, okay. So questions, comments. Yes. I don't think I need a microphone. Oh, that's a great voice. Okay. Oh, for the. It seems that there's a lot of patient outcome data. And um, it still seems in my read of the, of the data that there are not that many therapists who are doing this work. Right. So I think that one of the data that really needs to be replicated is across various therapists of various different levels of training in sure. different locations and so on. Right. It's a, it's a great uh, point. You know, a lot of the research initially has been done by Alan Abbas. It would be very easy to say, you know, he's just one of these superb therapists. It's him. It's not the method. Um, so he's also done studies. We had a four-center study, so it was four different therapists in four different states also getting the same outcome. And that Norwegian group, which I thought was totally amazing, these were really young psychiatrists and psychologists who had only had one year of training in ISTDP before they started to uh, provide the treatment uh, to that very uh, difficult treatment-resistant group. I mean, they're still in their core training. So um, it really does look like it's, it's learnable and that uh, young, talented people who are interested um, are able to learn it. Um, I'm going to be working with uh, two researchers at the University in Stockholm uh, starting in 2012. I'm running two new training groups and we're going to track uh, the effect of training on outcome. And this is really important because 
believe it or not, there's almost no evidence that any of the training we provide, right, to our clinical psychology students and our uh, psychiatric residents has any real demonstrable impact on the outcomes they're able to get. So it's kind of shameful, right? And we really have to do something to get better. And I know in clinical psychology, there's sort of this call now, right, for a few big ideas, they're calling it, right? So skill development is, is sort of the hot topic. So it looks like we can teach these skills. Um, people are learning it and getting good outcomes pretty quickly. Yes, in the, in the back. back. Hi, Dr. Coffin. thanks for that presentation. It always gets me so excited to try these things out in the general hospital where I see patients. Ah. One of the things I wonder about is, um, you know, when I remember doing therapy as a resident, you'd start off seeing someone and there's sort of what you, we would call a like pseudo improvement where they would get better after the initial sessions because they you kind of had revitalized hope sure. and, and you establish a relationship and then and then they sort of slide back into the usual pathology after right. so much time and um do you see that with ISTDP where people have a pseudo improvement and uh -huh. then they relapse or yeah. um or uh, you know, d does the improvement seem to stick more than with, say, traditional psychodynamic psychotherapy? Right. Um, do you need me to repeat the questions for the, someone had said for the taping? No, it's good? Okay. So again, uh, to me, this is one of the really exciting findings, is that not only are patients, again, who do respond to ISTDP, maintain their gains, but they get better and better and better over long-term outcome, and I don't know any other treatment that's been able to show that so far. So very low relapse rate, and people actually getting better and better over time with no further treatment. Yes. yes. This may be an impression, but it looks as though you really work in the transference early on. You get them to emote and sort of mm -hmm. tell you horrible things. And then it looks as though you become, you sort of slide into more of a traditional, you, you make interpretations, you get sort of responses. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering how essential that first phase is. Uh -huh. like Les Havens avoids working in the, uh, in the transference and he uses counter-projective counter techniques so that from the get-go, the two, the therapist and patient are together looking at a screen. And so they get, essentially, sort of everything gets projected onto the screen that they can then both look at. <laughs> And it, it has a nice effect because the, the, the patient can put it up there and then they both look at it and say, oh, isn't that interesting sort of thing. And it doesn't have the emotional outpouring. So I'm, uh -huh. I'm wondering how essential this beats you up early phase. Yeah. Well, first of all, th this is a highly disturbed woman, um, you know, who has uh, managed to defeat uh, everyone she's come into contact with. This is quite unusual to get this kind of breakthrough of feelings in the transference so early on. You only do that when it's absolutely indicated. My assessment was that her anxiety was so high and she had so many defenses, I mean just one after the other, right, that if I didn't get to the underlying feelings that she was defending against, how could she drop those defenses and form a collaborative alliance with me? So it really seems to me that these defenses, which become a resistance in the transference, block the formation of a truly collaborative alliance. So the only way for us ultimately to know, again, would be to do a head-to-head -head study with him on that. Um, but I think there's also a lot of evidence, there was a recent study, I think, that Lee McCullough and some of her colleagues did on interpretation in the transference. There's a really important distinction. I'm not interpreting anything with her. Making interpretations in the transference has some negative relationship to outcome. And I can kind of understand why, because if somebody starts making these comments, right, or interpreting, you know, you're seeing me as, as your mother and so on, it actually just generates more negative feeling, right? So it's going for the feelings in the transference, right, which seems to open things up. Um, and to clear up, I then become a real person, right, not a stand-in for her mother and all the other people who have disappointed her. So at least in my experience, it's, um, 
such a useful technique for people like this who I otherwise just wouldn't be able to make a connection with. But it's also pretty rare to, to have it come up so rapidly like that. Yeah. Uh, I thought I noticed in this presentation that uh, one of the key things you were doing uh, was uh, keeping pressing for the somatic expression. Yes. And I was wondering how general that is. Would, would that be a core important thing in other types of cases? Yes, um, again, getting as much as possible, right, the cognitive clarity, what's the problem, getting the emotional activation, and really checking on the physiological activation in the patient is extremely important. In a way, that's your safety valve. As long as her anxiety was going into cognitive disruption and she was getting confused and going around and couldn't focus, Right, nothing I'm going to do is going to be effective. She's simply not going to process it. So I kept working to see, could she bring that anxiety down into the body? And so she started, if you notice, to tense up physically, to have a lot of sighing respiration. And as she did, her cognition cleared up. She didn't blank out again. So that was my sign, right, that she was in a state where she could then tolerate the experience of her feelings without disrupting. So it's, I'm always keeping my eye on that. And uh, again, there is quite a bit of evidence that keeping anxiety in that optimal range and also getting the physiological activation of the feeling is really important, both for therapeutic change and brain change. So just talking about feelings from a detached position doesn't seem to have much impact. Right, it's the actual physiological activation. And again, Penna Baker did some good research on that. So people who talked about emotion but had no physiological activation didn't get the, uh, didn't get the therapeutic result. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Yes, again in the back. Exactly. It, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, Alan Abbas would be better at answering this uh, than I because he deals with a lot of those folks um, and, and maybe even showed some of those tapes to people who saw his work. Uh, again, the key is to really get their anxiety down, right? So if anxiety is too high going into cognitive disruption, you've got to work to bring the anxiety down. If anxiety is too low because the patient is stuck in defense, you have to be challenging to get the anxiety up into that optimal range. So it, um, you would want to do that and make sure that also in a way what we would call mentalizing or being able in those cases to think about and talk about their feelings, right, would be a prerequisite, right? We want to build ego adaptive capacity in those folks before you would ever, right, try to go to the underlying feeling because we know they get too anxious and then they have a really uh, disruptive symptom, right? So it, it's a, a graded approach that really is designed to build ego adaptive capacity. Yeah. Other? Yeah, yeah. question. So, uh, so we have a clinic here, you know, a large clinic with uh, many patients like this. Um, not a lot of time to see them necessarily. Uh, what would you think about integrating some of these approaches into sort of half hour visits or, or hour long visits? Mm. Where, but when you can't see a patient many times, do you think there's a value in that? How, how would you sort of approach that whole issue if you had right. many, many patients? 
Exactly, because the way ISTDP was designed was that we have usually an extended initial session. Um, I typically schedule people for three hours for the initial evaluation, which gives me time to get through that central dynamic sequence so the patient can, as Frida from Reichman said, have an experience, not just an explanation, right? So uh, if you can't do that, right, then how can you, maybe in a more modified form or piece by piece, begin to do this? Um, again, I think it takes a high level of, of skill and experience to be able to intervene rapidly with a woman like this. Um, and I probably wouldn't encourage that if you only had uh, an hour or if it's just residence, but um, I've certainly seen that just doing those first steps, um, doing a very tightly focused um, inquiry, right, just blocking the patient's vagueness, right, her hopelessness, why should I even, you know, you're not going to be able to help me, this is a test, I'm going to fail, right, so if you have some specific skills and techniques to deal with that, right, to block those defenses and appeal to the healthy part of her, are you willing to pay attention to yourself? Are you willing to develop a compassionate relationship with yourself instead of treating yourself in this way, right? So by learning how to do that, appeal to the healthy part, block these really unhealthy ways of re re relating to themselves and others, you're going to be able to, uh, again, begin to form that collaborative alliance, right? Just being able to identify defenses, right, for, for patients, have them also look at their anxiety and where it's going, right? So some of those early, way before you even get to a breakthrough of feeling, I think is really going to help um, the, you know, even within 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, apparently this afternoon I'm going to do a live interview with an inpatient and I'll only have, you know, 40 or 45 minutes, so we'll see uh, if that's helpful. Right, to them. Um, and I'm probably not going to go for any kind of breakthrough, right? Um, so I, I think that learning uh, the various components could be really effective and it's something that maybe, again, we could do some research on and discover. But I know when I was first learning this technique, I certainly didn't go in for that big kind of breakthrough, right? But I started to intervene in a much more focused and systematic way, right, that seemed to have a big impact. Um, yeah. Yes, in the back. I have a question with regards to the level of interviewing that you did and how do you gauge uh, the level of, um, there's a lot of violence in the dialogue on her part towards you. Mm -hmm. How do you gauge that piece and balance that out so that you don't feel at risk? Uh, say more about what you mean. Well, you were very dispassionate in, in right. gleaning the information from her. Uh huh. At what point would you look at and say that, you know, there's some affect rising here or what, what else is going on here? And then, well, you know, violence happens towards therapists. I see. Uh -huh. So I'd like right. for you to address that, con that idea. Certainly. That, that, that's a great point. Um, when people actually act out violently and attack other human beings, um, it's usually that they're having some sort of cognitive disruption, actually, right? So unless they're a psychopath, right, what happens is that these feelings start to rise. They get cognitively disrupted, and they'll often say, I don't know what happened. I saw red, and before I knew it, my hands were around his throat, right? So by keeping your eye always, you notice I didn't go anywhere near that until her anxiety was in striated muscle, till we had that understanding about what we were doing. Do you remember when she said, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? Uh, you mean what I would actually do physically? You mean like in my imagination, right? So she was clear, right, that we were talking about, um, of a fantasy, right? Not about what she was going to actually do. And in a funny way, providing that pathway, creating a safe space, right, where we can look at all these incredibly disturbing feelings without having to do anything about it, without her internalizing it and destroying herself, and certainly without acting on it, right, in many ways is the safest thing you can do, right? Because everybody else is, is spooked by this woman. Right? And doesn't want to go anywhere near her. 
right? Even her facial expressions, right, were kind of bizarre at times and, and threatening. So, I mean, this is the other thing going back to your earlier question about working in the transference. You know, my experience is that patients are incredibly um, appreciative of the fact that you're willing to sort of go to hell and back with them. And the corrective emotional experience of being able to look at all this without anything bad happening. In fact, it's the very thing that opens things up for a genuine connection. But you do have to be very careful in your moment-to-moment -moment assessment and make sure that the person is in strided muscle and that they're cognitively clear. Right, because if they're disrupting, then they're going to be dangerous, but not if they're really present there with you and you're clear about the task. But our anxiety about that, right, because again, I mean, it's very anxiety provoking, right, to look at this. And I think that's the other thing that um, I've seen so often and I'd love to test out is that the therapists who are getting the best results seem to have very low anxiety about this. Um, there's no other way you could do it. And also patients sense that, so if they sense that you're anxious, they're not going to go there. Yeah. So, so oh. thank you. Yeah, it was a very interesting couple of days. So I guess this is a follow-up question to that statement you just made, and that, you know, in, in supervising trainees for, for a while, I mean, one of the things that seems to be the most challenging is for people to be able to tolerate strong affect from patients. Right. and. and uh, escape from that in, in a variety of ways. So I was curious about right. your work with trainees in yep. terms of that specific, uh, I don't know if skill is the right word, but be able to... It's developing a capacity, right, to tolerate strong feeling without undue anxiety or yourself resorting to defenses. And so it seems to me it's a combination of personal development. You know, I find that most of the people who are motivated to do this kind of treatment decide pretty early on, I better go get some myself, right? So even if they've had good um, traditional psychodynamic treatment, they haven't had this kind. And so they know they haven't really sort of had their own defenses confronted and dealt with that level of, of feeling and impulse. So their own personal growth and development in that way. But also the way we do the training. The training is done in groups that are very cohesive, right? I do a three-year tra training group, and we're being exposed all the time, right? Through the videotapes, and we begin to make room for, it's not enough just to learn the skills, but again, to develop these capacities, to be self-aware, right? That I'm getting anxious, and I know I'm just intellectualizing with the patient now, uh, that sort of thing, and so, Dav and Lou found, and I have too, that the exposure, right, to this material also in the training and then being in a group where we can talk about, right, our own feelings, what's coming up for us, um, is very, very helpful. And people seem to get better and better at being able to, to tolerate it. And the more you try it and get success with it and see how profoundly people change, right, it, it really uh, sort of boosts your, your confidence. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. It's a combination, I think, of, of training and, and personal development that's required. Yes. Um, if there is anything to this distinction between conflict and deficit, deficit, deficit models, yes. it seems like ISTDP is more on the conflict. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I was wondering if you find that there are patients who simply can't do this work mainly because it's more of a deficit kind of problem. Yes, and yes, yeah, it's a great question. Um, in so how long have I been doing this now? Like 22 years I've been doing ISTDP and a handful no more, uh, that actually have deficits. So what may look like a deficit, right, if you don't know how to challenge it as a defense, right, it, and again, get through the defenses so you see capacity come online and develop. Uh, you know, there's a lot of research that suggests we're all born with two innate motivating factors. One is to become a true self. Infants from day one and two were our hypothesis testers. They're trying to figure out how can I have an impact on the world? Who am I? Right? And the other is to form secure attachments. So, no matter how buried, right, the desire for 
that authentic selfhood and connection, it's there somewhere, right? So the people have absolute deficits, right? That I remember this one woman, actually she was a nun as it turned out, like 70 something. Um, I tried everything and as I assessed it, it was clear she had a deficit in emotional um, identification. She wouldn't know a feeling for love or money. You know, never had, and, and it really was a deficit. But I find that it is very rare, at least in my outpatient uh, population. Um, so, yeah, I haven't seen that uh, typically. Yes, one other question? I was particularly struck by something that seems quite simple, and that is she presents all this about stomping on you and killing you and so on up here someplace, and you quote her back in this completely calm mm -hmm. voice. Right. With, I mean, the important thing here is, is your tone. Right and your affect, yeah. which is down here. Right. And that seems to me, uh, to me, what uh, is a very important part of all this. And Absolutely, I agree. Really, really struck me. Uh-huh. Now, of course, I think everything that's been talked about uh, is important there. That is to say, you have to be able to tolerate this stuff that she puts out in order to uh, maintain the kind of level of emotion that you reflect back to her. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's really true that uh, being able to stay present and engaged with her, right, but in a, a sort of calm way, right, so I don't detach, right, but I'm also not getting so activated myself with reactive feelings or anxiety, right, so being able to stay present and engaged with the patient and tolerate all of this without getting ruffled, I think has a dramatic uh, effect for her because again Tone. right the, uh, Your voice. right right but don't you think that's what's being um, communicated or right yeah I think I think you're right uh, thank you it was very interesting from an educational point of view for us to see that. And I'm just wondering um, if you tape all the sessions you do with patients, and then yes. I'm assuming they gave permission to use the tape in a setting like this. Absolutely. But if, um, you know, this is, I believe it's recorded and people can look at these tapes. No, if it's there's not. any um, sense, or perhaps it's not, but if there's any sense that she was, in a, you know, to, to see this about herself, I mean, I think that's exposing a person uh, quite a bit to people outside of an educational setting. So I just wanted to ask if you could comment. Yeah, on first that. of all, that would never happen. Um, the, the only people who have permission to see this, I, I have a um, videotape release form that has three options for them uh, because it's such a valuable tool. Right, uh, and, and often we'll watch it sometimes even with the patient, right? So one is just for you and me, right? So if you come see me and I say, you know, I'd like to be able to tape the sessions. Um, so one is we'll just have it for you and me. Two is that I could also go to a senior colleague for consultation if I felt I needed it. And three is for teaching, training, and research. They can cross out any of those. Right, when people, um, again, it's a very generous act, and many of the, if not most of the patients I see, have failed at repeated therapies before, and they're really incredibly grateful. And uh, one of the most traumatized women I ever saw, who just had such a big heart, and she said, hey, if this could help anybody learn to, to do better and, and to help others, I'm happy to do it. Um, but again, that we have to be careful about confidentiality. That's why I ask if anybody recognizes her, please leave. And I only have permission to show it to mental health professionals. So that's why I said they had to stop the taping uh, when the patient material came on, right? So nobody else could see that. And in fact, yesterday, someone who clearly wasn't a mental health professional walked into the uh, auditorium and I had to ask them to leave. So I'm trying to always protect their confidentiality. Um, at the same time, I use this, it's a remarkable teaching tool. 
And I really, you know, if you do nothing else but watch your own tapes, I mean, you see so much when you're watching them, right, that you missed, right, when you were in the session. So it, it's just a great tool to have. Okay, maybe one more, or should we wrap up? Bob? More questions? So, uh, so resident faculty incident, faculty incident joining us for lunch will be in, uh, what, what room? In Domenici, room 3010, and then um, 3110, thank you. And then uh, Dr. Cochran's gonna do a, a patient interview, we think, over in the new Domenici, uh, room so that she'll be alone with a patient and we'll have a live video stream into the video banks. We're trying to set that up. So that's really for first and second year residents. If there are third and fourth year residents who are really interested and, and free and want to see that or faculty, um, you can come on over and we'll, we'll cram into the, the space to watch the video. Okay, so Dr. Cotton, thank you very much okay, for joining us Okay, and thank today. all of you.